Thanks for pressing play. Our guest today is psychotherapist and best-selling author, Amy Morin. And Legends and Losers is super proud to be sponsored by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Check out netsuite.com slash legends. Amy's first book, 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, has become a sensation. And her new book is all about mentally strong parents. And that's really the theme of our dialogue today. Amy and I talk about how not to parent out of guilt, why you shouldn't be your child's concierge, why making children the center of your universe is actually a mistake, and why you should let your kids make mistakes. All right, all right, all right. The Ramon said, hey ho, let's go. And David Lee Roth famously said, you gotta roll with the punches to get to what's real. And uh, that's what we try to do here on Legends and Losers. Hello, my legendary friends. I'm so glad you're joining us for this fantastic episode. And uh, I hope you're doing great. I hope life's going great. Um, I hope um, uh, whatever's going on in your world is good. I really appreciate you investing some of your life with us here. I'm feeling pretty good myself. I just got back from a uh, beautiful surf. It's a wonderful day here. The, uh, as, as, as I like to refer to it, the specific ocean is beautiful. Uh, there was an otter as I was paddling out this morning. It wasn't really big waves, but um, nice clean waves and uh, got a handful of waves, feeling great and got back and uh, ready to do this with you. Now, um, Amy Marin is a, uh, she was one of our very first guests and, um, you know, she's back now with her new book. She's a, uh, a psychotherapist and a best-selling author. Uh, you can check out her backstory on the first time she came to see us, episode 21. And her new book is called 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. And um, she's an incredible person. She's become a sensation, one of the sort of uh, gurus of the moment. Uh, if you want to check out her background, her bio, and more information on her book, I suggest you go to legendsandlosers.com and check out the show notes. Uh, her and I have a fantastic, I think, riveting, fun, um, eye-opening conversation. Here she is, the legendary Amy Morin. So even if you're, your kids are already grown, maybe you're a grandparent or maybe you're a teacher, you're a coach, or you're just somebody who has kids in your life in some fashion, which hopefully most of us do, that you could figure out, well, what's my role? How do I help kids? Because I'm a firm believer that it really does take a village to raise kids and they learn something from all of their interactions with an adult. So even if you aren't their parent, you can still teach them lots of things about the world. Well, and sort of the aha that I've had is... Um how many genu generally good adults uh, that love a child are too many? <laughs> Right. Well, that's the thing is you think, well, how many, you know, loving, kind interactions do kids have with adults versus how many, how often do they maybe not have so that a good role model in their life or how many kids out there just, just need somebody to say, hey, that's okay, or here we go, or you can pick yourself back up. And I think just knowing that they have somebody in their life, and studies will show that at kids, as long as they have one loving adult, it doesn't have to be a parent, it could be a friend, a coach, a, a neighbor, somebody that guides them and mentors them that that can make all the difference in the world yeah and it's amazing how it shows up uh, a couple of weekends back um I, I spent a bunch of time with my wife's family who i absolutely adore and um she has two sisters both of them have three and one of the sets of three are quite a bit younger so um the 12 year old boy who's the middle child whose name is Fox. <laughs> we call him Foxy and he's, he's such a steezy kid. He's so great. Anyway, he's a, he's a soccer player and his soccer season was starting uh, the following weekend. And so he says to me, uncle Christopher, will you, will you come to my soccer game next Saturday? And in that moment, you know, you just have to melt because I think the cool thing about being an uncle is you can want to be an uncle or an auntie all you want, but the truth is blood or no blood. Um, the kid decides, right? Right. You got, if you're a kid, you have to deal with your parents. They're your parents, but like, you don't really have to throw the ball around with your uncle. If you think he's a, a, a meathead or a idiot or a creep or whatever. Right. And so there's something cool, I guess, about um, the kid choosing you, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Absolutely. I agree. I, I'm a foster parent, but I don't have any foster kids at the moment, And uh, but I'm an aunt. And so it's wonderful to, to have uh, nieces in my life. And when they do those things to me too, it just melts my heart. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the other thing that's fun is I've always tried to communicate with kids that I love, uh, particularly as they hit teenagehood, um, that I'm a safe outlet for stuff that for some reason, if they feel like they can't talk to their folks, they can talk to me and I'm not going to tell their folks. And once I we think- get out of the ditch or talk about whatever it is, we can decide how and if or, or ever we're going to talk to your folks. But like when you're in the ditch, you call Uncle Christopher. And I think it's great because we know that sometimes parents are offended. I'll see them in my therapy office and they'll say, well, he should be able to talk to me or my kids need to always tell me everything. But that's okay. Kids don't always need to tell their parents everything. We know that they don't anyway. I mean, I didn't tell my parents everything and I'm sure you didn't either. But to be able to have somebody, an adult that you can say, hey, I have this problem. I'm stuck. I don't know what else to do. Or, hey, I got myself in this mess. I think that's huge. And, you know, when, when I think about teenagehood, I mean, you have to negotiate a whole lot of shit from 12 to 21, right? Yeah. It's a crazy time. And you have your parents telling you to do A, B, and C, and then your friends are telling you something completely different. And the the messages kids are dealing with now that they're growing up with the internet and they're on social media and the messages they're getting from advertisements. I mean, it's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. And the kids have to figure out, who am I? Where Where's my space in the world? And they're going to mess up sometimes. And for us to be able to then guide them and show them, okay, you messed up that time and what can you do better next time? is really what they need. They need real world experience. We need to let them get out there and make those mistakes, but we have to be able to teach them that when you make those mistakes, how do you pick yourself back up? Well, and so you, you talk about that. Um, I'm just going to go through the list here because there you have, you, you get right on to this one. Um, don't let the child avoid their responsibility and don't shield them from pain. Is that, is that the kind of thing you're talking about, Amy? Yeah, there's so many kids, I think, right now. And it's as an adult, it's hard to to let kids go out there and do that. So there's so many kids that are, are not able to make mistakes. They don't fail. They don't know what it's like because their parents are correcting their homework or their parents are running up to soccer practice with their soccer cleats because they forgot them. And then kids never experience the natural consequences. And we're seeing when kids go to college, 60% of them say, I was academically prepared for school, but I wasn't emotionally ready. And I think we need to listen to that and say, okay, we're raising these teenagers who get great grades, but if they don't have the emotional skills, how do you deal with being lonely? How do you deal with being angry when an adult's not right there to calm you down, cheer you up, do all of those things that we do? And we need to start giving them those opportunities when they're much younger. Yeah, because we're going to be angry, right? We're right. Gonna, and we're going to be bummed out. Like I was bummed out this morning. It was a bummer for me today. Right. That happens. It's called life. Absolutely. And for kids to know that that is part of life and that you don't need mom or dad to be there to control your emotions for you. They don't need to be the one to say, hey, you had a bad day. Let's go out for ice cream or you're really upset right now. So I'm going to talk you down and calm you down. And once kids gain those skills on their own, then they can go out there. But we have to teach them. I see parents on one end of the spectrum who are so overprotective that they don't let kids ever experience anything tough. But on the other end, I see parents who who are more on the free range end of parenting where they just say, hey, get out there and experience life. But they don't (laughs) give them enough guidance. And so kids are out there fumbling around and then they don't even know when they made a mistake or they made a mistake and and nobody taught them how do you do better next time. So I think it's about finding that balance of giving them enough real life exposure, but also giving them enough guidance from us so they can navigate those situations better. And. Parenting today seems so radically different from when I was a kid, Amy. Like, of course, pre-cell phone, pre any of that shit, right? So in the summertime, I would get up in the morning, deliver my newspapers, come back, have breakfast, and disappear. And I would show back up at 7.30 at night sometimes. And my mom sort of might have a vague idea what I was doing, but 
you know, I could go over to my friend Jimmy's or what, whoever's and we could decide to go to the pool and maybe that wasn't in the plan or we could whatever or play baseball. Or, so, like we just were gone wild in the world. <laughs> and I'm, I, does that even happen anymore, <laughs> at least in, I, in the Western world? Right. No, I like to play this game called let's see how many times your parents would have been arrested. Right. So you'd say, <laughs> well, what did your parents what did your parents do when you were a kid? I never wore a seatbelt. My parents smoked in the car, right? I mean, the list goes on and on. I didn't even own a helmet. And if parents did some of those things today, somebody would call 911 if you had a toddler crawling around a seat and the mom smoking a cigarette. I mean, sheer panic would break out. But it wasn't that long ago that those things were all commonplace. But we've come so far. And I think and it's great that we've figured out, okay, you shouldn't probably be doing these stunts on your skateboard unless you have some safety equipment on and that will prevent you from having a head injury. But on the other hand, we've become so overprotective when you see the mom that's like rushing out on the soccer field to hand her 15 year old a sweater because it's a little chilly out. Or, you know, it's really hard, I think, in this day and age to figure out, well, what's safe and what isn't safe? Can you really let your 10 year old ride his bike down the street and back? It depends on a lot of things, but I think as a parent, it's a little bit tougher but to figure that out. You can't let your kid ride their bike down the block and back. Like, you got a different problem, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I see parents who live in you know, safe neighborhoods, and they still think, well, my 10-year-old doesn't know how to cross the street, so I can't let him out there alone. And rather than teaching their 10-year-old safety skills, they just, mom still walks him to school, or they don't ever let him out of their sight. Yeah. And part of it, I think, is the internet, you know, and the news today. We take these incidents that are pretty rare and we make them sound like it's going to happen to everybody or that it's an epidemic or that, you know, your kid's going to get kidnapped if he's in the other aisle from you when you're shopping in the store. And because of that, I think it's difficult as parents to figure out, well, what's actually risky and what isn't. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so I live in this town called Santa Cruz, California, and it's a very friendly town. It's a beach town. Uh, people here say hello and good morning and uh, you're not going to get run over in the crosswalk. And the only argument you're going to get into at a four way stop, if four people hit the stop at sort of the same time is sort of you, people saying you go first, no, you go first. You know, it's that kind of a place. Right. And I had this experience a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Carrie and I have six hens and they're the love of our lives, you know, people without kids have get into being aunt, auntie and uncle and they get into pets. Right. So right. Um, I go to the feed store, Amy, to go get the girls some food. And I walk into our feed store and they've got a stack of um, new baby chicks and it's stacked pretty high and I'm about six feet tall and it's the, the sort of trays are all on top of each other and they go almost to my height. And as I walk in, there's a little girl who, I'm going to guess is somewhere around seven or eight years old. And she's captivated by these chicks as am I, cause I, I love them. <laughs> I want to take all of them home. So I go over there and I kind of, uh, she sees me coming and I kind of say to her, Oh, you know, do you see some good ones? And she says, Oh yeah. And we're start talking about the different breeds and I'm having this conversation with this kid and I have not spied a parent yet to your point as to what aisle the parents on. And then a remarkable thing happens, Amy, uh, because she's a lot shorter than me, she can't see the top, I don't know, four or five trays. She asks me to pick her up so she can see the chicks. And I do. And we talk about those and our conversation continues. And then I put her back down. And then her mom shows up and just sort of joins the conversation. And that's what happened. And afterwards, I got in my car and I thought, because it didn't strike me at the time, but it sort of hit me afterwards. Holy shit. There's a lot of places in our world where that would never happen. And that's sad. right. I get why yeah. I get why, but that's sad that that doesn't happen. Like, am I crazy? No, I think in a lot of places, if a mom looked over and saw a man picking up her child, she'd scream and call 911. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a six foot guy with no hair and tattoos and you know, I'm, yeah, I, you know, I, I look like I could be kidnapping your kid. 
<laughs> so, you know, I think it's an interesting time that we live in because you think, okay, just being friendly and kind to somebody, uh, you know, where's that line? How do you make sure that, because I think it's great when we can all pitch in and take care of kids, but as parents, I think so many of them don't see it in the same light because we have this fear of bad things are going to happen, terrible things. Everybody's out to kidnap our kids. Yeah, and it's interesting because I don't think that would happen in a lot of towns. You know, would, I don't think it would happen in most of Silicon Valley, which is just over the hill from us. So I think part of it is, is environmental. Um, right. This is the kind of place where that happens. And look, the owner of the store could see me the whole time and, and so forth. But it's, that's not an unusual thing here. Um, if, another example is we get a lot of kids uh, surfing without their parents. So you'd have a 12 year old in the water uh, uh, regularly. And as that's going on, you can almost feel the adults in the water keeping an eye on the kid, if you know what I mean. Like there's yeah. nothing bad that's going to happen to that kid. There's not a chance. There's, there's, there's 15 or 30 or however many of us in the water. And we know that kid's out there surfing by him him or herself a lot a lot of girls actually which is so cool but anyway and sort of it's a community that does that and i think that's wonderful and i wish we had more of that where parents felt like there's a community of safe adults and everybody's pitching in and uh, able to keep an eye on your kid and that parents wouldn't necessarily get offended if another adult steps in because there's a safety issue on the playground I've heard from plenty of parents in my therapy office who are offended by that. Well, if your child's throwing rocks and another adult steps in and says, that's not a nice thing to do, I think that could be a wonderful lesson for the child and a great lesson for everybody. But I see so many parents who get offended by that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it does take a village. Now, if I go to your list, there's some that, that the, the first one that jumped out at me that was sort of very interesting was number three. They don't make their child the center of the universe. This is the one that I've gotten the, one. you know, I think this is the one that I've gotten the most question about, the most pushback about. And I didn't think it was going to be, but parents have said, well, of course, my kid has to be the center of my universe. And I think that just goes to show how entrenched we are in this culture that parents are supposed to be kid centered, that your life should revolve around your child. And what I mean by that is it's great. You, priority should change once you have kids. Your child should be a top priority in your life, but they don't need to be the only thing in your life. It's okay as a parent to have hobbies and to have interests and to, for mom and dad to go on a, a date night without the child. But for so many parents, that's actually a foreign concept. Everything they do becomes centered around making their child succeed. And I see parents who act more like they're a, their child's personal assistant or the concierge and they're going to cater to their kids to no end. And they see that as a good thing. They really think, okay, I'm giving my child every competitive advantage. I'm helping out. This is going to be such a wonderful thing because my child's getting a, a leg up in life. But what they don't realize is, is that ultimately you're hurting your kid. When your kid grows up to realize that the entire universe doesn't center around him, then that's a tough thing to swallow. Yeah, it's so funny, you know, and again, this is just the difference, I guess, in the generations. Um, I grew up with a single mom, and so she's working. We were what's called latchkey kids at the time. I don't know, do, do latchkey kids exist anymore? <laughs> Not very often. <laughs> yeah, and she would drop us off in the morning at Mrs. Neeracker's, and then we would, because the Mrs. Neeracker was across the street from the school, and she had all kinds of kids she looked after in the morning. And so that was the preschool whatever thing. And mom would go to work and then we would go there and go to go to school. And, and then we'd go back to Mrs. Neeracker's and she'd come get us. And then at a certain point, I, young, like I want to say maybe 10 or 11, I said to my mom, you know, can we get rid of this going to Mrs. Neeracker's bullshit? And and that was it. And she would just make us food and we knew how to make, you know, craft dinner macaroni and, and we would just come home and she would come home from work and that's just how it was. Yeah. I look back at my childhood, same thing. When I was in the fourth grade, I started staying home alone and it wasn't a big deal. And in fact, in I lived in rural, uh, I was probably around 10 or yeah. so. 
And we, we had a wood stove and I would go home, I would get home from school and I would start the fire in the wood stove. And I think about that now and I think, <laughs> no, you know, what, what parent would, would let their child do that now? But I knew how to do it. My parents had taught me. I never burned the house down. I knew exactly what to do. And it wasn't a big deal. But when you think about these things now and you think, uh, for parents, I think it's a huge deal to let your child be home alone. And even when they are, we're texting them every 10 minutes to say, what are you doing? How are things going? You know, and, we have missed cameras now, Amy. We were watching right, bastards. <laughs> right. And, and kids have more entertainment than ever, right? And like, he's just playing video games. He's probably not getting into any trouble or he's on his laptop or something. But for a lot of parents, that's scary. And I think in some ways it should be scary because if you've never given your child any skills, he doesn't know what to do. If something happens, then he's not ready to stay home alone. But once you give kids those skills, they can handle it. Yeah, this reminds me a little bit of the conversation I was lucky to have with Joe Decina. He's the creator of the, the obstacle race industry category, and he's the founder of the Spartan Race Company. And I forget the exact words, but Outside Magazine said he was like the craziest fitness freak in the world or, you know, something along those lines. And he's just like this alt uh, extreme athlete. And, but he's this he's an incredibly warm guy. And he made this comment that just rings in my head, which is human beings now have become the only animal on the planet that doesn't prepare its young for the world. I think that's very true. I think, yeah, I talk a little bit in my book about something similar about if we had an animal that was in captivity, we don't let it go because we figure out, oh, by the way, that this thing isn't going to survive out in the real world. But then with kids, right. we do the same thing and then we let them go when they're adults and then we wonder why they end up moving back home or why they can't, they end up dropping out of school or they just can't succeed in the real world because they just haven't had that experience that they need. Uh, we just had this guy, Isaac, on, on Legends and Losers, and he's the founder of this company called Praxis. And they, they exist to launch people into careers because what's going on is either young people are not going to college or they are going to college and they don't get a degree like yours where there's a kind of a, a career path. Although, as we talked about, you've taken quite, quite, the, <laughs> quite the right turn. Um, right. But, you know, if you, if you want to be a therapist or you want to be a doctor or you want to be a nurse or, you know, there, there's a clear path. But, like, if you graduate with a degree in humanities, what do you do, right? And so his whole aha for his business was because young people aren't ready, we got to get them ready. So he has a year-long program that's principally based on apprenticeship to actually get you ready to be in the world. And as I'm talking to him, all I'm thinking is, so – so let me get this straight. The kid's been going to school, you know, when you're 18, you've been going to school for what, 13, 14 years? When you're 18 and you're not ready to do anything. And then you go to college and now you've been going to school for 20 years, essentially, or 18 years, whatever it is, and you're still not ready to work. That's nuts. Am I, am I, have I lost my mind? But is that, that's crazy. It is. And the statistics on how many parents are now getting involved in their ch children's jobs, their adult kids' jobs. Did you write an article about this? I did because like, I just, I, and people. The first person I heard talk about this. So tell me about this. So when they surveyed uh, hiring managers and asked, I forget the exact statistic, but it's staggering. I think it's, I want to say 67% of hiring managers hear from parents. And so whether it's that the parents are Did you doing the kids' resumes. I believe that's the number. I could be wrong on that, but it's staggeringly high. And because parents are either filling out their kids' resumes for them, they're submitting them. Sometimes the kids don't even know. When I say kids, I'm talking about college students. I'm not talking about 15-year-olds getting their first job. But these 22-year-olds whose mom is essentially applying for the job for them and sometimes parents are showing up to the job interview with their college graduate and sometimes hiring managers and recruiters are hearing from mom and dad saying you know what can my child do or what they're negotiating dads are more isn't likely to negotiate i hate to interrupt you amy but isn't that the worst thing possible i mean if i was a hiring manager and a candidate showed up with their parents they'd be like definitely not this person Right. Imagine I just 
you know, envision this mom saying like, my son is a real self-starter, right? In this interview. Yeah, exactly. And trying to convince this hiring manager, my kid is awesome and they're going to do a great job for you. And you think, how is this happening? And so dads are negotiating salaries. Parents are dealing with disciplinary issues. If a adult child gets in trouble at, at the office, parents are calling human resources to talk about it. You know, it's so funny because this is a bit of a uh, chasing a zebra down a rabbit hole, but it's, it's connected as an advisor and board member of, you know, a bunch of companies over a bunch of years. Um, when those companies go to raise money, you know, they're going to go raise a series C and they're trying to raise 25 million bucks or whatever it is. Um, and they want to leverage the relationships of, of their board or their advisors. And most of us will have relationships with various venture capitalists and so forth and so on. So we do all that, right? It's a common thing that advisors and board members do in, in the Silicon Valley startup world. And, and then there's always this debate with the, the founding team. Should I, as the, the person with the relationship with the VC, be in the meeting or not? And I'm always happy to go to the meeting. And every once in a while, I do go to the meeting. But in general, it's a bad idea for me to be at the meeting because the relationship needs to happen between those founders and that venture capitalist. And they need to show they can stand on their own two feet. And, and, and if I give the pitch for why this company is awesome to the VC, we're fucked, right? And so that's right. the, if in the, in the rare time I go, I, I go in, I shake hands, I sit down, and I, I bite my tongue till it bleeds. <laughs> right. You want to show that they're good. You know, to hear it from somebody, you know, just like if somebody's parent says, my kid is awesome, well, it doesn't, I'm sure you think your kid is awesome and all, but it doesn't mean they're a good fit for the company. It doesn't mean anybody else is going to think that, that we need people to be able to show that they are competent. That, that that one is 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 wackadoo. The other one I wanted to ask you about. Um, <clears throat> I've been fairly outspoken, particularly over the last couple of years, about um, uh, my I call it dysphuglia because I have dyslexia and dyscalculia and executive function disorder and ADHD and bipolar. So I just put it all together in the cocktail and just call it dysphuglia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and there's there's a lot of conversation about this stuff and um so anyway i recently got contacted by a publication and they wanted my opinion for an article they're writing uh, and the and the question was should parents get kids tested or not and are there pros and cons and how should they think about it and the first thing i recommended to them amy and i'm curious because of course I'm not a medical professional and you are. <laughs> but the first thing I said was take the kid's opinion and put the most weight on that. That does the kid want to get tested to unpack this stuff or not? Because it's, it's their brain, it's their life. And then my second one was be a hundred percent straight with the kid about what's up. And so, because my parents were like that with me, they didn't treat me like I was an idiot kid. They were straight up with me. And if they talked to me like a kid, but I always felt like they were being candid and clear. And so, did I recommend the right thing <laughs> or, or educate me? You know, I think it depends on the first on the first one about deciding whether or not to to get the kid tested. I think it depends what it's for. I have a lot of kids who if they are entrenched in something like bipolar they have depression they may not see it and they're not thinking clearly because because they have bipolar and depression so they need help with that so i think in certain cases parents can override you can certainly take your kid's opinion into consideration and show them that you value their opinion but ultimately say it's up to me on the other hand it can hurt your kid too uh you know to be frank as a therapist i've seen people who will uh, come in when they're about 18 and they say, I want to join the military, but when I was seven, I got diagnosed with ADHD. Can you write a note that says I'm okay? And so it does have a long lasting effect on your child's life if you get them labeled with something. So I do think it's really important to take all of that into consideration. Boy, that and, makes me so mad. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, like in California to get um, special help, you have to be diagnosed with, you know, dyslexia as a disorder or 
whatever the fuck they call it. And it just makes me so angry because uh, you and I have different body types. People have different brain types. And so people with this stuff have different brains. Now, are, are there real things that we need to deal with? Yes. I never know where the keys are. Math was over for me in grade three. So if you and I are out at dinner and I'm paying for dinner, I'm going to ask for your help calculating the tip because I'm probably going to get it wrong and I don't want to screw the waiter or waitress, et cetera. It's, and there's a million of those, right? And, and right. The executive function disorder and what that means, around how I have to pay attention to parking a car and how I could never put together Ikea furniture and on and on and on we go, right? So th there are real downsides to this stuff, but there are massive upsides. And that's the part that drives me crazy that, that um, we're not in a world yet where, that is focused on that. And we had Dr. Daryl Trefethert on Legends and Losers recently, and he's considered to be the world's leading authority on um, genius, savantism, um, and uh, he, he's one of the world leaders on autism. That's sort of how he got into studying genius and savants. And, you know, he describes it as um, they all have these islands of genius in them and we have to find these islands and then cultivate them. And at his center, they focus on, I think he called it, have you heard this term, strength-based education? Yes. Yep. Where you really so look at and say. What are your thoughts on all this? You, you know, I think it's great. And I think to your other point before too, I think it's fine to tell kids. I think it's really important to tell kids if child's been diagnosed with something, by all means tell them. Otherwise it's a big, huge secret and that comes with shame and it's not good for kids. And so then to the second point, as far as strengths-based learning and that sort of a thing, yeah, you can tell your child, you'll learn a little differently. And maybe what works for some other kids in the class, it doesn't work for you, but it doesn't mean that you're bad or that you're stupid. It just means we're going to do things a little bit different. And I think for kids to have that message is super important. Important. I've had so many parents come into my therapy office and they'll say, you know, don't, don't tell him he has ADHD or we're not going to talk about that. And they act like it's a huge secret. Well, your child probably already knows he learns differently than other kids. And he might have come to the conclusion he's stupid, he's dumb, he'll never learn. And so unless you tell him the truth and you just straight up with him and say, this is what's going on and this is what we're going to do about it, your kid may grow up with the belief that he's not capable of doing things. Yeah. And there's this term dyslexia is a superpower that I really, uh, that I really like. And I, I, you know, that's the other part of this that I hope we get to is that um, people that have this stuff also realize there's a huge upside to it. You know, the, the, the number of incredibly successful, incredibly creative people who uh, are, are able to do and see things that a, a quote unquote normal brain person can't is, is pretty impressive. And, and so yeah, I pray for the day where we cultivate that in kids. Yeah, I think for all of us to know, we all have probably could be easily diagnosed with something in our lives, some sort of disorder, mental health issue, something. I mean, the statistics from the CDC say 17% of us are functioning at optimal mental health at any given time. So that means the vast majority wow. of us aren't. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that <laughs> explains a lot, know, Amy. <laughs> But, you know, we look at mental health as if you're either mentally healthy or you're mentally ill instead of saying, hey, there's a spectrum and we're all at different points in our lives on different points in that spectrum. And it's well, not you know, mental the illness. Same day, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Right. You know, depending on what's going on and what's going through your head. And so I think for us to know and that that's why I talk about mental strength, because I say you can build mental muscle. You can help prevent some mental illness. You can't prevent it all. Just like physical strength. Working out is good for your body. Well, working out is good for your mind, too. And it's not um, it's not stigmatizing to talk about mental strength. I've had some people say, well, you shouldn't talk about that because some people have depression and they're not weak. No, they're not weak. You can still be mentally strong and have a mental illness, just like you could still be working out in the gym and have diabetes. It's all the same thing, but for us to know you have some power. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't think about, I don't think of myself as being, you know, dis fill in the blank. So maybe I just have a different relationship with it. Um, but like on the bipolar thing this morning, you know, when I was feeling bipolar, like fucking depressed, 
and, and way more than I quote unquote should have been over the issue, right? So I know it's an overreaction. Mm -hmm. And what's happened for me over time is um, ha having an IQ and an EQ helps, right? So, so understanding right. intellectually, okay, you're overreacting. Um, and this feeling's not going to last forever. And so either suck it up buttercup or do something to change it. So I said, fuck it. And I went for a surf. And I'm good. <laughs> and so right. I guess I, we, we can teach ourselves or people can teach us tools to deal with this shit, right? Absolutely. And I, my hope is that someday we'll talk more about tools and how do you, how do you deal with that stuff? And that in writing this parenting book, I was really hoping that I'd give parents the tools to teach their kids. Some people said, why don't you just write a kid's book? Well, if your 10 year old sits down and reads this book, he's probably not then going to go out and apply this to his real life. We need to make sure that the parents have the skills so that you can be there in the moment. So when your your daughter's upset about something, you can coach her. Or when your son is angry about something, you can figure out how to help him learn the skills to calm himself down. And parents are the ones who need those skills to, to become mental strength coaches. Now, what if you're a parent who has some, you know, part of dysphoria going on for you? <laughs> and so that plays into trying to be mentally strong with your children. How, how, how would you navigate that? Well, I think to figure out how do you take care of yourself, how do you deal with, cope with your own emotions, how do you deal with all of that, your kids are watching. And so I think for parents to become a, a good role model uh, is really important. And one of the things I found that I hadn't planned on was so many parents who have read my book said, I use those exercises that were designed for kids, I use them on myself. And a lot of these people are out there, they've got wonderful jobs, some of them are stay-at-home parents, some of them have college degrees, but they're from all walks of life and they're saying nobody ever taught me this stuff so now I practice it on myself and I find that really useful the same exercise that works for a 10 year old works for a 40 year old and so I think that's wonderful that parents are, are now saying I'm practicing this stuff on myself every day too well and the, the super cool part about that I, I remember years and years ago um, listening to these Jack Canfield tapes when he was sort of a motivational speaker before the chicken soup books had even broken. And one of the things that he talked about was the ability to go back in your mind and, and parent yourself. So if there were, if you had an experience as a child where you felt like you didn't get the right parenting or you didn't get any parenting or whatever it is, you could actually close your eyes and sort of go back in your mind and say the thing to yourself that you wish had been said or do the thing, whatever it is, right? Go back and right. reparent yourself. And, and I thought, isn't that an interesting way to complete with it? And so um, I'm not surprised to hear that because that makes total sense, Amy. Right. And nobody was talking about this stuff when, when we were kids. It's sort of this new idea of, hey, let's talk about emotions. Emotions matter. Let's talk about coping strategies. And so for parents to, to now be practicing this stuff, I, I think that's a wonderful thing for them to be learning it right alongside their kids if this is the first time they're hearing it. Yeah, one of the things I like to do uh, is to think about thinking. And I, I think about language and words a lot, Amy, because languaging creates the thinking. And so with that said, one of the things I find myself thinking about is we in our language distinguish between thoughts and feelings like they're separate things and if you say well wait a minute why is that the construct because I know in my own brain in my own thinking there are thoughts that cause feelings and feelings that cause thoughts and and they feel blended sometimes and so um, I'm not sure distinguishing them the way I think most of us have been taught to distinguish them, distinguish them is always the most powerful way to deal with it because there are thoughts that I can have that cause a feeling and vice versa and they can work together in a positive way or a negative way and, and, and being able to realize, well, why am I distinguishing these things? Maybe they're connected or in some cases, one and the same. Does this sound crazy to you? Does this make any sense? 
And it definitely makes sense. So researchers, you know, have spent years fighting about what happens first. I don't know how many people come into my office and say, what comes first, the thought or the feeling? As you just said, it depends, right? Somebody, you get scared and then you think about scary things because you felt scared when you're anxious. But on the other hand, if I said, hey, let's name all the horrible things that have ever happened in your life, your mood's going to go downhill fast. So for us to figure out sometimes just to recognize that they're connected and then what do you have control over so that you're not a victim to if you wake up on the wrong side of the bed you don't have to stay there that's another big thing that I've heard from people is they say no you you have no control over your emotions well of course you do and that's not to say you need to to always try to figure out what to do when you're feeling bad you shouldn't talk yourself out of feeling bad or you don't always have to be happy Uh, uncomfortable emotions serve a purpose in our life, but that you don't have to stay stuck in a bad mood. You don't have to stay stuck in an angry mood, that you have some control over it. And so I think for people to figure out how do you think differently and then how do you feel differently? And I'm always amazed at people, adults who sometimes still struggle with that concept or they struggle to to separate it. I'll say, well, what did you think when that happened? And they'll say, I felt mad. So then we say, well, that's a feeling. What did you think? What ran through your head? And so sometimes I think it's important to distinguish between the two. And then you say, well, I have control over how I think. How can I think differently? And that will change how I feel. Well, and, and to take it a little deeper, there's also distinguishing between the thoughts that I'm having or, the, or maybe said more accurately, the thoughts that are rolling by or rolling around in my head that just, I don't even know how the fuck they got there. They're just rolling around. And then there's me thinking. And there's a big difference, right? Because <clears throat> we can turn on the news and get an update on what's going on in Washington and, and we're going to have thoughts. But we're not really thinking, Right. We're not sitting down going, now, wait a minute, hold on. What do I truly think about this? Let's unpack it. Let's, let's, we're just, we're just, we're just, there's a, there's a thought that blows into our head called that was good. That was bad. That's stupid. I want to kill him. I love that. Whatever it is, right? It's more of a reaction that's rolling around versus, because to your point, somebody cuts me off on the road and I want to fucking kill him, right? Right. I haven't been in a fight since I was, I don't know. 10 or 11 years old, 12 years old. I'm not going to kill him. I'm not going to do anything. But we have that thought and then feeling, and then we go, we're not doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah, you, we talk about that in terms of your automatic thought. We all have an automatic thought when somebody cuts you off in traffic, when you wake up and it's sunny out versus the day you wake up and it's raining out, or uh, everything we do, there's something that pops into our brain. And that stems from sort of our core beliefs about life. And eventually you can change your core beliefs and that sort of unravels or changes those automatic thoughts that pop into your head. But in the meantime, so then how do you how do you respond to those automatic thoughts? How do you talk back to yourself? How do you come up with something more rational? Because a lot of times our automatic thoughts aren't rational. They're craziness, like I'm going to kill the guy that cut me off in traffic. And I don't mean to demean this because I struggle with some of this too. So, uh, you know, know that. And isn't part of this just like becoming an adult in some ways? Like, uh, you know, somebody will say something in a meeting and I'll think that was really fucking stupid. And generally I don't say that was really fucking stupid or um, an incredibly attractive woman will walk down the street and I'll have all kinds of thoughts, none of which I do anything about. Right. And on and on and on. Uh, And so, as an adult and sometimes those thoughts trigger feelings right Mm -hmm. isn't isn't just part of becoming an adult really realizing that there are these you did you call them trigger thoughts automatic thoughts automatic thoughts Mm -hmm. that that go down um and we have all the say in the world as to what we do about that and then on you know let's say a particular political issue and i don't want to get political but you know if you take something like abortion well, a smart person sits down and says, yeah, I've heard all this stuff. What do I really think? And goes through the pros and the cons in their head and, and they come up with whatever position they come up with. But a smart person just doesn't 
take the opinion that's been puked on them. They, they actually think about it, I guess is my point. And so we have the ability to control our actions in response to the thought, but we also have the ability to sit down and, and think, now, what do I really think about this? I know what my initial reaction is, but I may or may not agree with myself on that. And I think some people struggle with that a lot more than others. I think in today's world, if you just spent 10 minutes on the internet, it's easy to see. Not everybody does that, right? And if you look out in the world and you say, gosh, you know, there's a lot of people struggling to do those things, whether it's their behavior, they keep doing things and then say, why did I do that? But then they go right back out and do it again. Or somebody who says, I keep blurting things out or I say things and hurt other people's feelings and I don't mean to. Or people, they just get stuck. Their automatic thoughts, they believe them. So they believe their self-doubt. They believe that they're a loser and then they get stuck and they just can't figure out how to get unstuck. Yeah, that is amazing, uh, particularly on the internet. I, I, I uh, a little while back, got into a uh, Twitter debate with a, <laughs> a, a VC at a big ding dong VC firm on Sand Hill Road. And this guy is a former very big ding dong, big deal guy at Microsoft. And, it, you know, I, first of all, I always take the position when I'm doing something digitally that the person's sitting in front of me. Mm-hmm. So I try, I, I work my brain real hard not to, to just react like an idiot. Um, even though I'm sure sometimes I do, but anyway, that, that said, we're going back and forth on this thing. I mean, I tell you the details if you care. And I realize that it has degraded from a dialogue to he's, he's now going to make me look bad. That's now what's happening. He's trying to make me look bad. So he declares on the, in a particular example we're using that I'm wrong. And he says, that's not what happened. And then he writes, pow, exclamation mark. Like he just knocked me out. Like he just you know, dropped the mic. I just won. So I respond back to him with, okay, great. Educate me as to why I'm wrong. Tell me. And he doesn't, he, he never, that was it. That was the end of it. And I just thought, really? Like this guy's, I don't know. He looks older than me. If he's my age, he doesn't look that good. <laughs> so, you know, he, he could be in his 60s. He could be in his 50s. I don't know how old he is, but he is not. This is not a 16-year-old idiot, right? This is an adult male executive. And that's how he conducted himself on Twitter. And it, I just, I was amazed. Right. And I think we're seeing so much of that, that, you know, the evolution of social media and the internet, and that stuff it's like so many people have just lost their minds everything that they wouldn't do in real life that they plays out online and um you know i think we have a long way to go to figure out how do you still be civil and kind in it and behave on the internet the same way you would as if somebody were sitting across the table from you i say you know even with the limited space on twitter i say i very respectfully disagree and here's why i, I am not trying to back people into a court. I have not, because I, you know, a Twitter fight is like, you know, I got way better things to do in my life. I mean, for the, right. you know, the love of whoever you love, it's craziness. Right. Um, but you know, a dialogue with 15 people about something you care about, you know, it was the same thing after the Conor McGregor fight when McGregor fought Mayweather and you know, this was a big deal for fight fans and I'm a boxing fan and a MMA fan. And like, you try to talk to people about that and like, they just go mental. Cause if they're a boxing fan, it's like Connor's a, a wanker and a poser and you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. And if you're an MMA fan, it was like, well, that, like, and just, it was, it was ridiculous. It's like, Hey guys, it's a fight. Like it, we're, it, it's supposed to be fun. Like, fuck, we're, but you can't have a civil conversation with fans. Like it, it gets, it gets crazy fast. Yeah. And I think, you know, that goes back to your other idea. People that wouldn't normally do a lot of this stuff in, in real life. And then suddenly they're fighting over, you know, stupid things on the internet that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. And rather than having a, and going into it with the idea of, I want to learn more, it's more about, I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. Now, if we go back to the book for a second, another one that really jumped out at me that, and, the, and I read the headline, I don't know, 15 times, number 11, they don't confuse discipline with punishment. So this one is really about saying, how do you teach your kid to do better next time? That's discipline versus punishment, which is saying, I'm going to make you suffer for your mistakes. And 
I think in our world, a lot of people say, no, kids aren't being punished enough. We need to punish them more. But we see these consequences some parents are using, and it's about shaming their kids. If you were to look up shaming on the internet or parent shaming, you'll see that so many parents are posting pictures of their kids, videos of their kids behaving badly, and then hoping to shame them into behaving better. That doesn't wow. work. Really? They do if, that? Yes. If you look up parent shaming, you'll come up with hundreds of thousands of videos on YouTube of parents who are just showing, hey, look at how bad my kid is, and this will teach her a lesson. And you That's think about crazy. Well, Who's, be, who's more likely down the road, so when somebody says to, to a child, hey, do you want to try drugs? The one who's been shamed his whole life and feels like he's a loser or the kid who says, yeah, I've made some mistakes, but my parents have taught me how to, how to behave better. And I see desperate parents try to do things, and they're, they're just desperate to get their kids behaving, behaving better or they're embarrassed, and they go to these great lengths. And unfortunately, sometimes although they're well-intentioned, they go in the completely wrong direction and it backfires. So you really need to teach your kid, okay, you've messed up, what can you do better? And we need to give kids consequences, absolutely, but shaming them publicly is definitely not one of the ways that you want to give them a consequence. I'm all for saying, hey, assign your kid extra chores, give them natural consequences. Your child breaks something, make him pay to fix it, or he misses the bus, make him pay you the gas money if you're going to give him a ride. I really think kids need specific consequences for their behavior, but shaming them or punishing them in a, in a physical manner isn't going to get you the results that you want. Don't you have to whack the little bastards every once in a while? <laughs> According to every study out there, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite Ramon songs, Amy, is beat on the brat with a baseball bat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hear from so many parents will We'll say, well, I was faked as a kid and look at me, I turned out well. But so far, there's, there's one study that said, you know, spanking a kid around the age of four may not be quite as bad as, as we think, or it may be equivalent to timeout if timeout doesn't work, something like that. But other than that, every study shows it lowers IQ, it leads to more mental health issues, and the list goes on and on. It leads to more aggressive behavior. And I think there are plenty of alternatives in today's world that you can come up with that will hurt your child worse than a spanking anyway. Make your child go rake the lawn, and I guarantee that that will teach him a lesson as opposed to uh, smacking him. My mother used guilt incredibly effectively. The, the, the letting her down, that whole thing. Yeah, well, you know, studies on guilt will show that it, it's not good for kids psychologically when they grow up. When parents try to use guilt as a, as a way to, to make their kids change, then they're more likely to have relationship problems when they grow up. Well, that, that, that explains my divorce then, doesn't it, Amy? <laughs> 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 you know, I, 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 all, all kidding aside, I, I don't feel any negative effects from my mother's guilt. I just took it. Well, I, I actually, I don't know how I took it then. How I took it, how I take it now is just uh, she loved me and I was a big kid and I was going to do whatever I was going to do. And she really couldn't do a whole lot to stop me. And so um, she made me... Uh, she made me feel bad if I let my mother down. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, you know, and I think to an extent, when you have a healthy relationship with your child and then your child feels bad that they let you down and they feel guilty, there's definitely a point where they can have a, I mean, it's good to have a conscience. It's good to feel guilty about some things. And then the line is, if your parents are, you know, if you loved me, you would have done the dishes. That sort of a thing is when it starts to get into trouble. And I don't know where your mother fell on that spectrum, but it's more on the extreme end where parents try to use it as a, a manipulation tactic that it starts to become unhealthy. Oh, I'm sure she was manipulating me with it. I don't know if she ever said, <laughs> if you love me, you do the dishes. But certainly she said, if you love me, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't stay out all night on a Saturday night and freak me out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> now, um, let's see. Uh, they don't take shortcuts to avoid discomfort. That one is really about when we all do this sometimes, again, uh, that you just want to get out of the moment. So your child's screaming in the middle of the grocery store, so you hand him a piece of candy to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this stop. Um, those are the kinds of things. It's uncomfortable. It's embarrassing. Or your child's whining repeatedly, so you finally give in and say, fine, you can have it, just to make them stop whining. 
or when, after you've said no and then your child comes back and is begging and pleading and you say, fine, okay, you can do it just this once. But those are the things that teach kids unhealthy lessons and that as a parent, it helps in the short term, but it makes your life worse in the long term. Same for your child. You don't want your kid to grow up thinking that there's shortcuts. We live in a world where everybody's taking shortcuts from performance enhancing drugs to thinking that you can cheat on a test to get your way through school better. You know, teach kids that, yeah, things are uncomfortable sometimes, but you can stand it. Yeah. Grit, the good, the good old grit. Absolutely. And for them to know that discomfort won't kill you, it's just uncomfortable, but it's okay to feel uncomfortable sometimes. Now, um, switching gears a little bit, it looks like you're on a boat. I am. <laughs> so, so am I remembering this right? Was it have you been on, living on a boat for two years? Is that right? Yes, yes. It has been two years now. Didn't you just write something about this? I think I read, you, you read something about living, what it's been like for you on the boat, right? Yeah, I wrote a little bit, an article for Inc. Magazine, sort of about just having a simpler life. And living on a boat forces you to have a little bit of a simpler life because you don't live on a, in a giant mansion with 25 closets or anything like that. You get one little closet if you're lucky or you, you can only bring so many possessions with you and there's not um, as many things that you have luxuries that you might have in a house. Life's a little bit different on a boat. So it's like, what, what do they call those mini houses or those, um, there's a name. Oh, the tiny it. homes. Oh, the tiny homes. That's it. Yeah. So is it sort of like living on a floating tiny house? It probably is. I think that the people that make tiny houses got a lot of their ideas from boats because people who built boats figured out how to be really efficient with, with all the little space that you have. And you, if I remember correctly, you have this, and I'm, if I'm prying too much, you just kick me under the table. You have a significant other on this boat, do you not? I do. I'm married. So it's my, my husband and I and a dog and a cat. <laughs> and so that's a lot of, I'll call them people because I think of my critters as people too. So there's four people on this boat living together, right? How, how, long, right. Is, how long is the boat? Um, this one's 53 feet, so it's a sailboat, so it's fairly large, but okay. um, yeah. And we, but, um, but it's still a boat you're living on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> However, it's docked most of the time. We don't go out. I'm not floating away at sea right at the moment or anything. And um, the, the, uh, it's in a marina, and there's dock space, and there's a tiki hut outside. And um, so I do have outdoor space, too. Yeah. And um, so you're enjoying it. I am. It's wonderful to be able to, to be here. There's manatees and dolphins and, you know, crazy things that I just didn't get when I lived in a house in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a projection as to how long this continues or are you just, you and your husband are just going to do this and maybe you will decide to leave or maybe you won't or what, how do you think about it? I think, um, you know, once this book is written, which is due in a couple of weeks, so it'll be done and soon I'll have more time and I'd love to, you know, then go on some more bigger adventures and um, set sail and do some stuff and then we'll just see what happens. So you want to take that puppy out for a ride and maybe go somewhere. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a very cool idea. Um, and is, can you give, uh, can you give me a bit of a preview of, um, of the new book for, for ladies, for women? Sure. So, you know, I just, I kept getting questions from women. My, sort of the progression of this as I've been flying by the seat of my pants is I'll write what people want to know. And I've gotten so many questions from women to say specifically, how do we as women stay strong? How do we raise kids that are our sons to be respectful of women when they grow up? How do we raise daughters who don't have body image issues? And so many questions along those lines. And my publisher and I decided on, on this book um, last fall, sort of before the Me Too movement started, and then that happened, and now everybody's talking about women, so I'm hoping the timing of it's going to be great, but it's really about specifically what are the issues women face in today's world, and how can women deal with those things? And uh, so I think that's great, and do you want to give me a sneak preview of a couple of the points you want to make, or a little, like, give sure. me a little teaser of the ideas in the book? Sure, so I... One of the big ones is uh, for women is it's tough for women to, to own their success. So, so many women will play it small or they undermine themselves or they think that uh, it's, it's not attractive to, to be smart. So in so many ways, so one of the big things in the book is about how do you do that? How do you own your success? 
But then on the other hand, I also talk about how not to blame yourself for too much, that women tend to, to feel extra guilty and struggle with taking on too much responsibility. So part of it's about taking on healthy responsibility, speaking up for yourself. Um, but along the same lines, it's about bad habits to give up and how do you become the strongest woman that you can be? I love it. Um, you know, as somebody who's married to a, an absolute powerhouse, I, I, I see it. You know, she's, a, she's a, a smaller person, a five foot person. And I don't know how much that played into it. I got to think it was some, but, um, you know, when you look up fierce in the dictionary, there's a picture of my wife, Carrie. And, um, you know, she's a very, very powerful, self-confident woman. And she coaches a lot of other women because they go to her and they, they see her as a role model. Um, and so I think it's really cool that you're doing that. Thank you. I'm excited about it. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the cool part about it is it's applicable everywhere. Of course it's applicable big time in business. And there's a lot of discussion about that now, but um, in all aspects of life, right? Right. I'm talking to so many stay at home moms who say I feel undervalued or I'm talking to women in business who say, um, I just spoke to somebody this morning and she said, I'm, I'm too direct. People get angry or upset or put off by me because I'm, I'm direct, but men can be direct. But in my performance evaluations, people say to me, it's great that you're direct, but be careful, sort of implying that, that she was too aggressive if she came out and said things because she was expected to be nice. Maybe this is a, just a personality trait or deformity. But you know, when I hear stuff like that, I just think, yeah, go fuck yourself. Like, I, you know, I got this email from somebody recently and they were criticizing my uh, email communication style. And I just think, well, they go fuck yourself. Like, isn't there an element of owning who you are and, if, 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 if you're a woman who people are going to call bitchy or whatever label they're going to put on you being direct, then isn't there like, isn't it just powerful to just say, well, then fucking, Hey, call me a bitch. It is. But for a lot of women, then there's consequences for that, that if you don't change, you don't morph into something that your boss wants you to be, then, then you run a risk. Or if you don't, meet certain expectations that society wants you to be, then how do you deal with that? And so of course it is freeing to be able to just say, this is who I am. I'm going to be myself, take it or leave it. But then how do you deal with the ramifications of that? Well, so here's what I'd like to uh, sort of poke on here. My experience of being in the world is that we live in a world that for the most part wants us to fit in. And best I can tell human beings are flock animals, pack animals. And so fitting into the pack makes a lot of sense. So there seems to be sort of a, uh, an evolutionary DNA based uh, sort of set of reasons for why this fitting in desire is so strong. But that said, um, you know, one of my big dreams, Amy, is that one day people appreciate the exponential value of what makes them di different as distinct from the incremental value, which makes them better. You know, most people, most of us are comparing ourselves and we try to be better, you know, and in school, you got to get better grades and to make the team, you got to be better. But when you look at the most remarkable people, the vast majority of them are different. Picasso was different. Muhammad Ali was different, right? And so it, it, for me anyway, it's the people who have the courage to be themselves and say, you know, fuck fitting in, fuck that. Like, and so I don't know, maybe this is just a rant I'm on, but um, there's a sadness for me about that. And, and we're not supposed to have 100% of the people like us, right? And so... I don't know what percent of the people you could tell me you're the medical professional are supposed to like us. But the way I think about it is if you don't like me the way I am and look there, of course we want to interact with people in a responsible way and so forth and so on. But there's, there's some line we're all trying to find between being ourselves and not pissing the entire universe off. Right. And so as we dance on that line, 
isn't it okay to say some percentage of people aren't going to like me or get me and kind of just fuck them and that's the way it's supposed to be and I'm going to be myself? Oh, absolutely. I think we could try to play it safe our whole lives and say I'm going to fit into whatever mold. I'm going to make as many people happy and I'm going to go through life trying not to offend people. But you're going to offend them anyway. So I think to just accept that certain people won't like you and that's okay. It was one of the reasons why my message went viral. I angered a lot of people. They were really offended by it, and yet they kept talking about it. And for as many people as I offended, I also attracted people. And it's uncomfortable to get those emails of people that say, this is terrible, awful, and I hate you. But I get many more, thankfully, that say, I love what you're saying. But I think it's tough for a lot of people to do that, to know that somebody doesn't like you for whatever reason. But it's usually not even about you anyway. It's often about how you look or how something you said or they took something the wrong way. Uh, but to come to that place for a lot of people is really tough to do. Hmm. So how do we get better at coming to that place if that's the healthier, uh, stronger, mentally strong place to be? Part of it is just recognizing that it's not always about you to not personalize it. In fact, I wrote another article this week about that, about when – if you ask somebody, what do you think about the three people, three kind of neutral people, listen to what they say. And most often they're describing themselves. So when they say, oh, that person's an idiot. I hate that person. They're so annoying. You'll tell a lot about their character just based on what they say. Okay, that's a really negative person who's, a, who's afraid of this and that. So you can learn so much about people based on what they say. And so I think part of it's just taking that step back and saying, okay, it's not necessarily about me. And to take feedback, to be open to hearing what people have to say, but recognizing that somebody else's opinion doesn't necessarily, shouldn't be weighted more than your own opinion or um, because you get feedback from people or if you happen to have a blog or you have a podcast or you write a book, people are going to say really mean things about you. But to know that, that's okay. And let's say you repel 33% of the people. Well, you'll probably attract 33% and the other ones will be neutral anyway. And that's okay. But yeah. it's just par for the course. And I also think, I don't know, maybe you can help me with how to think about this. Uh, so a little while ago, um, uh, one of our listeners reached out and said, Hey, uh, love the show, blah, blah but I'm not going to listen anymore because you say the R word. The R word being retard. Mm -hmm. Retarded. And, and um, turns out this was a Dr. Sean Peterson and, and he works in the field and, and so forth and so on. And I had never really thought about it. I mean, I'd heard some rumblings that people, some people didn't think it was all right to say, but I just sort of took that as more political correct crapola because I never, I would have never said that word to somebody with a handicap. And so, it, you know, when I was a kid, if you dropped the ball at third base, we would say, oh, you are word, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so he wrote me this very thoughtful email, but it was also very firm. Um, but he left the door open for me. You know, he didn't call me names or he didn't do any of that, but it's very, you know, thoughtful but strongly written i'm kind of not listen and i think this is not a good thing you're doing and so my initial reaction was a defensive one and then i started to for the discussion we had earlier amy i started to think and what became clear to me was um the people who the word is directed at get to say and even though I wasn't ever in my entire life directing at those people, some people do. And there are other words like that that I could, you know, share with you that we all, you know, I don't, I don't call people faggots either, right? And there's a lot of other words like that. And so anyway, I guess my point is, um, after considering his email, I thought, you know what? He's right. This isn't just sort of politically correct stupidity. And this isn't hey, um, to, to the point on authenticity, um, he wasn't saying, don't say fuck or shit or all, you know, because I swear that's just, it's how I talk. And so when we started Legends and Losers, I said, I'm going to be myself and I'm going to talk like myself. And so if somebody said to me, love your show, hate the swearing, stop swearing, I'd say, hey, that's really great. Sorry, going to keep swearing. But I, I, I considered this differently, I guess is my point. 
and I'm doing my utmost to correct my behavior because I, 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 I now agree with Dr. Sean. And the last thing I would want to do is hurt anybody. And so uh, in that way, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm changing my behavior. And so this is all leading to a question, which is, how do we find that line between, because I could have argued, well, that's just my self-expression, go fuck yourself, Dr. Sean, right? So how do we find that line between what is us and what we should consider because maybe there is a different way we should behave. Well, first of all, you know, I, I think that's great that you did that. Cause I think that, I think the vast majority of people wouldn't be able to do that to come to that conclusion. But, and so I think just what you did, you take a moment, don't go with your gut reaction. Cause the first things out of your mouth are probably going to be defensive. So to say, okay, take some time to think about it, be willing to evaluate it. When somebody says this is offensive and your job isn't to, to go through life, not offending people. But on the other hand, people are hurt. And if you can do something to not hurt people, that's a wonderful thing too. So to find that balance between what's important in your life, is it, is it that important to you to keep doing this stuff? If the answer is yes, then you do it. If not, then you say, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. I didn't know. I didn't understand. Thank you for telling me. And I think if we could do more of that, the world would be a much kinder place. I, I agree. And I haven't always done that. Um, and, uh, you know, you try to be a better person over time. One of my favorite quotes, Amy, is uh, if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know you have one? Right? That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, uh, I fancy myself, I self-identify, Amy, as a champion of the people who get screwed. <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the underdog. I'm the underdog. And I have all these things that people call, you know, I, I shared with Dr. Sean, um, and, and by the way, I, I asked for his permission to talk about this. Um, so, so, so I'm, you know, I'm not breaking a confidence. Um, I shared this story with him a few weeks before his email to me. There was a story on uh, Business Insider about dyslexics who were doing well in business, but I forget what they called it. Whether they called it a disorder, or a disease, or a disfuck, whatever they called it. And, and I'm, I'm on, on a mission to get people to call these learning differences and that we have different brains. And it may sound like semantic and it may sound like political crap to some people, but I think it's actually meaningful and, and because I think words create thinking and thinking creates action. And so I sent this reporter what I thought was a very nice email saying, wonderful article, thank you. And going forward, would you consider because, bah, bah, bah. well, guess what? I didn't even hear from the guy. And that's offensive to me. And so, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, maybe we should just be a little more curious and, and, um, and thoughtful on that stuff. I don't know. You tell me you're the expert. Yeah, I think so too. You know, it's something that I've struggled with too as a writer. I, sometimes articles that I put out there in the world offend somebody for one reason or another. And I had a woman just, just probably two days ago who had written to me and she was concerned about my book and because it was called mentally strong. And she said, not everybody's mentally strong. And that's great that you went through tough stuff and you got through it, but not everybody's able to do that. And you may be offending people. And I took the time to write her back and, and say, I completely agree. I agree. Some people are going to be offended by this, but I'm hoping that I'm helping more people than I'm hurting them. And my eventual goal is that people will learn about mental strength the same way we talk about physical strength and that it's not a bad word. It's not a dirty word that we all have the power to, to choose to make better choices with our life. I didn't hear back from her after I wrote it, but I very easily could have just dismissed her or, or ignored her. And I really just wanted to take time out and say, I heard what you said. And this is what I think to show her where I was coming from. But I, it's something I've struggled with too, with emails. I get overwhelmed by the amount of messages I get, which is lovely that so many people want to reach out to me. And to know that dismissing people isn't helpful. I don't respond to every email when people are hateful or um, say really inappropriate things. I don't reply. Um, but when people really, really want to have a dialogue. like that, Amy? You get hateful, yes. inappropriate to you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that blows um, my mind. How's that even possible? Really? 
I mean, I can see how may, somebody might disagree with some, something you, you said or wrote, that, but there is nothing about um, how you present yourself, how you communicate. There, there's zero that elicits any, oh, yeah? Fuck you, I'm going to tell you. Like, where do they even get that from? You're incredibly affable. And like, I, w- w- how is that even possible? If you um if you get bored and you really want to know sometimes, if you just read some of the comments on my TEDx talk, so it's been viewed almost 7 million times. The vast majority of comments are kind. There are some that are not. They make fun of everything from the way I talk, the way I look, to um, the clothes that I'm wearing. And so I get emails sometimes with people pointing those things out, what I should do differently in my life or how I should dress or speak differently to. <laughs> Well, I think all those things are wonderful. I think you have a wonderful voice and you present <laughs> yourself well and you seem like a spectacular gal to me. Like I, what the, and the, the thing that drives me crazy about that sort of stuff is, look, maybe they disagree with a point here and there. Um, and actually, I think this is not, I, not to get political, but I think this is the political problem in our country. W- 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 the place that you're coming from is clearly a good place. Clearly. There's, there's no question that Amy's trying to make a difference in the world. That's what you're doing. And there may be other motivations and whatever, and I hope you're making a ton of money, and, and, and God bless America. But the, the, the play, it is so obvious that that's where you're coming from. And so maybe somebody disagrees with a thing or a word or whatever it is, but like, how could they attack you for the way you look or speak or even your ideas when it is so obvious that what it is you're trying to do, even if they think you're misguided in some way. And, you know, and I think that goes back to your other point about, you know, how do you figure out how to be appropriate on the internet? And um, how do you, even how do you say kind things? I get emails from men that are inappropriate. And and I sometimes just want to reply and say, did you think that that was an okay thing? I'm just curious what your motivation was. Did your mother never teach you that you don't say that to women? Um, I ignore them because I really don't uh, want another reply from them, but it's fairly common. And I get an I email. Assume this, you're, sorry, go ahead. This one actually made me laugh and I didn't reply to him, but um, in my TEDx talk, I have a black dress and I obviously have dark hair. And the email that I got said, uh, you look like Wednesday Adams' hot cousin. you like, got to be wh- kidding wh- me. <laughs> No, and so, you know, and messages like that fortunately aren't all of that common, but uh, but they're not that rare either, that I get a fair amount of messages, and if you, again, if you ever get bored and you read through the messages on my TEDx talk, um, you'll see some interesting messages. Because I find this fascinating. <laughs> I just don't understand what moves people to do that. Like, I would never, I would never, particularly not knowing you, comment on your dress right you know if if you and i now that we're getting you know we're getting to know each other and by the way i hope you come back when when your new book comes out um and you know if we were to meet at a conference or an event or you happen to be coming and let me know and we had dinner or whatever you know i might say oh you look wonderful this evening or whatever you know but like that's where you, you don't do like you know what it reminds <laughs> me of jerry seinfeld has this bit where he talks about guys honking at women. Mm-hmm. And, and he, I forget the bit exactly, and I can't really imitate him, but it's something like when you see guys honking their car, you know, their car horn at a woman, this is a man who has completely run out of ideas. Because there never in the history of men and women has there been a guy who honked his horn and she said, oh, yeah, great. Why don't we get together? Why don't we have sex right now? Like that never happened. Right. Ever. Right. Maybe once in a penthouse letter, but like never in the real world. Right. And so like what insanity, what, like what, you know, I don't know. I don't understand why a man would do that. It's a complete insanity. Yes, it is. And that was another reason for the women's book. Cause I think we deal with some bizarre things and, you know, and I think it's not just women that, that probably need to read the book. I think it would, would be great for men to, to read it too, to learn more about some of the, the stuff that, that women are going through. Now, I'll tell you this, I have never had to put up with an email from a woman that said I looked like Uncle Fester's cousin or something with my <laughs> hairdo. <laughs> well, 
Well, and you know, part of my in writing this book was wondering just that, you know, as a as an author, how many male authors get bombarded with emails from people either about how their voice sounds or how how they dress or how they look compared to to what's it like for women? And I think men get some of that, but I think women get far more of it. Yeah, no, I don't get that. I, I get some that are a little flirty, which is always a little fun, but never anything really, you know, inappropriate. Or and I certainly never get women saying that I should wear this or my voice should be like. I mean, I don't. I've never had any of that. Yeah, and that's what most of the studies will show. Or uh, there's people. There's a story that's going to go in the book about a, a podcaster who gets complaints just for. Uh, about women guests because people tend to not like women's voices as much as they like men. So she created a special file just for people that complain about women's voices. Well, they're gonna they hate legends and losers because we have a lot of unbelievable gals on, on, on this on this programming. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right, Amy. Anything else before we wrap? Well, thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk to you. Well, you're spectacular. I love what you're doing and. Um, like I said, off the top, your success makes me happy and it makes me really ha happy that you would talk to me uh, <laughs> and hang out with me. <laughs> and I hope well, you come back when, you, when your book for uh, women comes out. I will. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Amy. Be legendary, my friend. <laughs> Bye. Wow. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Amy as much as I did. And uh, if you know somebody who would love this conversation, why not email it to them right now? And uh, we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared it on social media as well. And uh, we really appreciate your shares. Um, I want you to know every time someone writes a, a review, we get that. Um, the whole team sees it. It's a huge uh, shot in the arm for us. It helps us grow the show. So if you got a chance, we'd love it if you wrote in iTunes or wherever else you um, uh, experience podcasts. Uh, took a second to give us a review. Now, our good friends at NetSuite want to help you grow your business. Um, the interesting dichotomy with growth is uh, it's what we're all striving for in business, and yet it comes with a whole series of headaches. And so NetSuite is a complete platform for running every element of your business. It was purpose-built for the cloud. And if your business isn't on the cloud, I would highly suggest that you need to be, be there. The other interesting thing is, you know, as, as uh, we start to evangelize this idea of niching down, uh, my buddy Kevin Maney, his book, Unscaled, I think we're living at a time where the technology is allowing smaller companies to do things they never could before. I mean, that's very, very clear. And to compete in nimble and effective ways, creative ways that they never could before. The interesting thing about NetSuite is you can literally have the uh, infrastructure of one of the largest technology companies on the planet, uh, Oracle, behind you in your business. NetSuite uh, really works for companies of all sizes, so from uh, the garage to the IPO and beyond, and handles all of your back office functions, accounting, finance, cash flow, and we're living in a multi-channel or what now people are calling an omni-channel world. That is to say, your customers want to be able to buy from you and interact with you on their smartphones, their tablets, uh, of course, on the internet, etc. And uh, NetSuite has a powerful set of capabilities for omni-channel commerce that is very cool that I'd highly suggest you check out. Now, what NetSuite is offering for our listeners is an opportunity to sit down with an expert in your industry and talk all about growth, the opportunities you have, the barriers you have, and, uh, and how you might turbocharge your growth. So in order to set that up, go to netsuite.com slash legends, and you can book a time to meet with a NetSuite guru um, and, uh, and have a great conversation. So check out netsuite.com slash legends today. All right. We would like to thank the incredible new book from Amy, 13 Things Mentally Strong Parents Don't Do. Equity Directory, the invite network of entrepreneurs and startup talent exchanging work for equity. Harper Collins, instant classic, play bigger, how pirates, dreamers, and innovators create and dominate markets. The great people at One Life Fully Live. This is a nonprofit organization committed to helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check out onelifefullylived.org. Ah, my good friends at Snap Sports. This is a company I love. I'm an investor in this company, and uh, Ben Larry is an incredible guy. This is how the action sports industry makes money off of photo revenue. Check out Snap Sports with a Z, 
or a Z, depending on your beliefs, uh, dot com. Speaking of companies I love, uh, my dear friends at Verve Coffee, Verve is the official coffee of legends and losers. They are the craft California coffee that um, is really like nothing else you've ever had. Their, their commitment to excellence is extraordinary. Check out vervecoffee.com. Now, are you planning a vacation or a Hawaii uh, wedding or an event in Hawaii and you're doing some kind of a special event? Check out Bell Destination Events for your corporate events, for a special event, and of course for that special wedding. Check out Bell Destination Events, Weddings in Hawaii. The good people at Flourishing Leadership Institute Check out lead2flourish.com. This is an extraordinary outfit run by two extraordinary guys. Shout out to John and Scott. And if you're looking for how to produce breakthrough results in your company, these are the guys who can help align your team and make it happen. Flourishing Leadership Institute. And a podcast I love, the B2B Revenue Leadership Show with Brian Burns. Check it out. We'd like to remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. And we have to warn you, all episodes do clearly contain nuts. <laughs> this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it. Now remember, Steve McQueen is Steve McQueen. Don't eat food with ingredients you can't pronounce. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Support your local category designer. There's no such thing as a participation award. Be a legendary, mentally strong parent. Listen to the Ramones. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this podcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our apologies go to Oscar Munoz, CEO of United Airlines. Sorry, Oscar. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. I uh, deeply appreciate it. And we'll see you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>